Good evening. About nine months ago, an orthopaedic surgeon walked into my laboratory and he was holding this. It's a metal artificial hip. And he said, why is it that a proportion of the patients I implant these into develop inflammation and pain? Well, why should the immune system recognize sterile metal? Well, actually, we now know, because a German research group about uh, two years ago published an elegant paper showing that essentially one metal in particular, and that metal is nickel, can be recognized by the immune system, which just mistakes it for bacteria. Now, looking at the audience, I think there may be 500 of you, so perhaps 50 will know the allergy to nickel. And it's that allergy that causes the ear to become red and inflamed and wear cheap nickel-containing metal jewelry. So I looked at that hip and I thought, well, maybe there's some nickel there. So I thought I'd phone the company. Hello, can you tell me what metal this hip is made from? Yes, it's a hard alloy. It's about two-thirds cobalt, one-third chromium. What? No nickel? Well, of course there's no nickel. Nickel would be very dangerous. People are allergic to nickel. Don't you know that? <laughs> so I went back to the drawing board. Or should that be my dodgy dress sense in the periodic table? And if you look, you can see that nickel is a transition metal element. Right next to it is cobalt. And things that are adjacent on the periodic table tend to share chemical properties. So I wondered whether the immune system would respond to cobalt. So I went and found a master's student. And I asked her, to, <laughs> asked her to develop an assay for me uh, to see whether the immune system would respond to cobalt. So she set up an assay. The assay responded to bacteria, which we know the immune system should. The assay responded to nickel, which we know the Germans say it should. And then came the day we put cobalt in for the first time. Would the assay respond? And I think you're probably all ahead of me now, but lo and behold, yes, it did. And it was terribly exciting. We became the first scientists in history to show that the human immune response would actually recognize cobalt. And I went off, very excited to tell the orthopedic surgeon that we now knew the answer. And he was quite unimpressed, actually. What he really said to me was, what can I do to help my patients? So my master student became my doctoral student, and I gave her a new project, which was actually to divide the patients waiting for hip operations into two groups. One group that would respond to cobalt in these things and therefore should not receive them, and another group who do not respond to cobalt and can use these mechanically excellent artificial hips. Thank you. about transplanted organs and possibility for transplanted organs. What, what, what is the reality of the future for transplanted organs? Well, it depends on the organ, I think. At the moment, there's some terribly exciting studies showing that actually we may be able to grow organs and replace kidney organs the actually. Other week, with, didn't we? Yes, kidney mm -hmm. just the other week, and indeed hearts, the heart's just a muscular pump. So there's a possibility there. Um, kidneys actually, in reality, are, are really quite complicated organs, and I think that it's going to be some decades into the future when we're going to be able to actually you know, generate a functioning kidney in the lab. Um, so, you know, the transplantation of kidneys is a reality, and we're going to be sitting with that, I think, for, for decades yet. And wh when, when, when do you think some of these, uh, I don't know, grown in labs or grown in a pig might actually... I mean, is, is that a reality for us? Grown in the lab, I, I, it will be a reality, but I think not within not in probably my professional lifetime. John, um, one of my best friends uh, uh, at university as an undergraduate 30 years ago, his name was John Kirby, and I thought, I can't be him. He's far too old to be doing something like FameLab. Um, probably the same age as you, so what? <laughs> <laughs> not me. <laughs> um, I mean, all joking aside, it's, you know, you, you stand out as being much older than the other contestants. Is it something, you know, science communication, something you've had a passion for for a long time, or is it a newfound mm, passion? It's a new thing. I think very much I've been of the order of sort of going off to conferences, giving 10-minute, 15-minute presentations, perhaps some plenary talks, longer sort of things, and old dog, new tricks. I've actually, since I've become exposed to FameLab, I've, I've very much started to enjoy this, and uh, 
after winning the regional heat, I've gone on and done some, some, some sort of uh, um, lecturing to school kids and so on. And I found that actually communicating my science by perhaps telling stories about how it's really done and why we do it is it, quite a powerful means of communication, and I do enjoy it. Good for you. I think immunology in general is probably not communicated well. And if you think about immunologists, they are the superheroes, really, of life science. They've saved, <laughs> more, they've saved more lives, you know, blood transfusion, Jenna vaccination. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, one more time. Superheroic. Oh, did you, you look like you were just... Go on, I'll go, I just, I was just to follow up on Jim's... I don't care, quite get it either, uh, John. It's just, it, you're out from your lab. You, you've left all the poor PhD students back there. You know, you're supposed to be writing grants. Science is incredibly competitive. How do you justify the time up here today? You know, and, and when you should be saving lives, as you oh, just God, pointed yes, out. That no, you, you're right. I, I can show you all the emails I've been not, answering no. out the back. But uh, you know no, because I mean? Mark, as a professor, you never do any science communication, yeah, do you? Yeah, you're here. <laughs> 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 <Very good. laughs> No, we, we've got to foster the next generation of scientists coming through, and if we can excite people to come and do the sort of science that we enjoy, really perhaps at the earliest stage capturing them and, and firing their imagination, then that's got to be important. Thanks, John.